the record message come yes okay so uh, good evening welcome to this session of isc pg clinics uh, we are uh, having a, a recent advances series the first one is uh, on recent advances in hepatology the second one is on gastroenterology and the third one is uh, on endoscopy these sessions have been planned in such a way that the exam going students will benefited from these sessions because uh, our experts will go through the recent advances and prepare the slides uh, and actually save the time of our students Otherwise, they have to go through all the journals and uh, uh, read a lot of articles. But our experts actually do the job for them and we present to them in a nutshell. So that will be extremely useful for our students. For today's session, we have uh, Dr. Sirik Abbey Phillips, who will be formally introduced to, uh, the, to you. Uh, welcome, uh, a warm welcome, Dr. Abbey. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, the chairperson for today's session is uh, none other than our beloved uh, Shanae, sir. Uh, so I am very happy that two avid researchers are on screen and senior person and one a young person. So it's a good combination. So over to Shanae, sir, for introduction of uh, our uh, speaker as well as to continue the session. Thank you, Dr. Varghese. It is always my pleasure to be with uh, the Indian Society of Gastroenterology, Kerala chapter PG meeting. And I am privileged to have one young and bright star, Dr. Syriac Abi Phillips. He is actually the proud son of India, representing India in the hepatology meetings globally, has won many awards as the young investigator, the young scientist, and probably as the best uh, orator in most of these meetings. Dr. Abhi had his post-graduation at uh, ILBS with the Professor Sareen, and he has proved himself worthy of the position by having more than 200 to 300 publications in a privileged and a highly indexed journals. Dr. Abhi is currently the senior consultant in the Liver Institute at Rajagiri Hospital, and he is also running a BC research unit focusing on microbiomes. The next 40 minutes are with Dr. Abhi to give us a glimpse of what is happening in hepatology under the different sections of basic hepatology, clinical hepatology, translational research, and many more things in the next couple of years. Dr. Abhi. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, sir. I, th I, I, I hope I am uh, audible well. Yeah, very yes. well. Um, welcome, so, to uh, also. welcome to Jayanti Ma'am also. We are the moderator. Dr. Nah, Jayanti Ma'am. Proceed. Yes, sir. Um, uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to uh, present this very important topic. And as always, it's a pleasure to uh, teach uh, the students. Um, and, and I think this is most the most important part of uh, specialty training. And uh, thank you to Professor Katie Shanae, sir, for the introduction and uh, to my moderators, uh, Professor Vargis Thomas and uh, Professor Jayanti, ma'am. Uh, so without much uh, delay, I would like to start off with the first uh, topic. So this is going to be a different kind of presentation because I am not going to bore anybody here. Um, I have chosen topics randomly and I'll be presenting randomly so that people don't get bored. So I don't want to show you continuous uh, fatty liver disease uh, studies, continuous alcohol liver disease studies, but I'll, I'll just mix and match so that uh, it'll be fresh in the minds of everyone who's listening. So the first uh, study that I would like to present is this. It's a very important uh, position paper. It's not actually a study. This is the paper which changed the terminology for NAFLD and NASH to MASLD and MASH. So this is by the consensus societies of uh, ASLD and ESL. So what they found out was that when we use the term non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it has negative connotations. For example, when you say non-alcoholic, uh, it's stigmatizing. And when you say fatty, it's even more stigmatizing to the person. So we, we give, do away with all of that. And we now call it as steatotic liver disease. So that is SLD. 
so it's no more fatty liver disease it's steatotic liver disease and that is either identified on uh, imaging as steatosis or in a biopsy now if the patient or a person has specific features which is given in these boxes that is adult criteria and the pediatric criteria based on the uh, presence of one out of five in any of these particular uh, factors given you call them as uh, having metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease that is MASLD. Uh, if these patients have uh, metabolic dysfunction along with uh, less than significant amount of alcohol consumption then you call it as met ald which is metabolic dysfunction with you know uh, presence of alcohol use and at some point when there is significant alcohol use we call it as ald that is alcohol associated liver disease so there are other causes also for steatosis not just metabolic syndrome so then we have uh, patients with specific uh, steatotic liver disease like for example certain drugs can cause steatotic liver disease for example corticosteroids um, there are certain monogenic diseases that that are up, that is for example in wilson's disease in children you can have a fatty liver so that that will become a monogenic liver disease which has a steatotic component so it's a very very simple way of uh, describing uh, steatotic liver disease based on the criteria. Now, what is the spectrum? So you have uh, metabolic dysfunction associated liver disease, which is MASLD. And on one side, if you actually look at the second box here, you'll see that these numbers, 140 by 210, and at the extreme is 350 by 420. So that is the weekly amount of alcohol intake in grams. And if you go down, you can actually see the daily amount of intake, which is 20 grams in female, 30 in male. On top is 140 in female, 210 in male. So weekly, if it is this much and daily, if it is this much in males and females, then you can club them under MASLD, which is, there is no significant alcohol use. So it is metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. Now, if the patient is on a higher amount of alcohol use, for example, in women, 50 grams per day or in men, 60 grams per day, then that is the ALD predominant. So that becomes met ALD. So this is mass LD and this is ALD. Now, if they go beyond this, that is beyond 50 and 60 or beyond 350 and 420, that goes to ALD, that is alcohol-associated liver disease. So this is very easy for us to make uh, patients understand regarding what kind of disease they have and what are the factors that we need to modify in them. So it is no more NAFLD and NASH. Uh, it's not easy for us to directly jump into these terminologies in the practice because patients don't easily may not easily understand how this change has come into being but at least in your documentation please use these terms because at, at some point uh, this has to uh, become the standard of uh, discussion on uh, steatotic liver disease now the second uh, paper i would like to showcase is the liver hope trial so this is a very important trial and uh, this is not published yet so I've taken some studies that have been recently uh, discussed in ASLD and ESL also, because this, this will become publications later on, maybe in the next three to six months, but it's important for us to know about it. So uh, this particular uh, study looked at uh, patients who are on statins. That is, uh, uh, they gave patients 20 milligrams of simvastatin along with 1,200 milligrams of rifaximine, that is 400 mg TID for every day for 12 months, that is about a one year. So these patients are uh, decompensated patients and they looked at how many of these patients actually go on to develop acute on chronic liver failure. So this ACLF is defined as per easel. For example, there is single organ, double organ or triple organ failures based on easel. So based on that, when they looked at patients who were receiving the treatment versus the patients who were receiving placebo, they found out that there was no association with reduction in ACLF or complications of cirrhosis or death with uh, simvastatin and rifaximin, which means the combined use of statins and rifaximin did not improve any outcomes in patients with cirrhosis with respect to ACLF development or other complication of cirrhosis and death. So this, this was a negative trial, but I think it is very important because there are specific groups where this may be uh, useful, but uh, at the moment, uh, with regards to ACLF, this is not very useful. The second is this very important study where they have actually shown the importance of uh, natural history in alcohol-associated liver disease. I think, this is, I think this is something that we need to really look into. So imagine somebody comes to you with a diagnosis of chronic liver disease and he's been consuming alcohol heavily in the last uh, few many years. And uh, you 
evaluate the person and obviously we do a fibro scan or a shear wave that is now a standard that we do in most of the centers and you get a fibro scan saying it is f0 f1 or a fibro scan that says it's f2 or it says f3 to f4 now what does this mean with respect to what the patient is going to face in the future very importantly this study has found out that when they followed up these patients with recently diagnosed cirrhosis or chronic liver disease due to heavy drinking they identified that when they were followed up for about 6 years uh, about 15% of them progressed to decompensation and this is very important because even after uh, stopping alcohol or uh, in those patients who were not drinking so heavily so that particular data is not very clear from this study because it's just an abstract that is published so when they looked at these patients who have recently been diagnosed with ald and underlying chronic liver disease they found out that 15% progressed to decompensation in 6 years and the decompensating events and the, the the proportion of patients decompensating was higher with the baseline fibrosis grade so if it was f0 f1 2% of them decompensated at 5 to 5 to 6 years but if it was f3 to f4 then the number of people decompensating was actually up close to 50% which i think it's quite high i mean this is very important because if you get an alcohol liver disease patient who is recently diagnosed and has f3 or 4 that means within the next 5 years uh, he has a chance of 50 50 of getting into a decompensated or a complicated liver disease stage and most importantly was that about 22% of these patients actually died in 5 years in in 5 to 6 years and the number of people person per uh, year death in in 100 person years was highest for f3 f4 so this is how the natural history of ald goes in patients who have recently diagnosed with ald with past history of heavy drinking um this now we jump to uh, steatotic liver disease which is uh, metabolic associated steatotic liver disease or mash um when we have a patient who is recently diagnosed with metabolic syndrome or uh, metabolic dysfunction associated liver disease we always talk to them regarding control of metabolic complications for example uh, control of diabetes control of hypothyroidism management of dyslipidemia or weight loss so this particular study looked at weight loss per se and this is a very important study because it is a meta analysis so they looked at all the randomized control trials that looked at uh, liver fat reduction using an mri measured uh, method this method is very important because this method is actually validated so if there is a more than or equal to 30% relative reduction of liver fat as measured by an mri from the baseline that means there is histological improvement uh non alcoholic steatohepatitis hepatitis activity uh, resolution of steatohepatitis hepatitis and improvement in liver fibrosis stage so without doing a biopsy the mri liver fat method measurement can actually give you an, a, a good validation of what is happening at the histological level so what they found out was that if patients who are uh, you know irrespective of the weight if they did 150 minutes per week of brisk walking so brisk walking is basically 100 steps in 1 minute that is 100 steps in 60 seconds that is brisk walking if they did 150 minutes of brisk walking in a week then irrespective of the weight loss they actually had three and a half times more likely to achieve clinically meaningful reduction in liver fat which is wonderful i think this is such an important data so that people should know that you know they should not be stressed and they should not be under stress to lose weight just by walking 150 minutes per week brisk walking uh they can actually lose liver fat without losing weight and i think this should be one of the most important advices that we give overweight or obese patients in our uh, day to day opd regarding improvement in uh, mass cell or mash now we jump directly to an interventional management so we had a very simple um in uh, a simple interventional management with walking now we go to a, a an invasive management in the form of endoscopic metabolic therapy so uh, i mean this is very well known uh, if you look at the splendor trial which was a trial done in cirrhotic patients with uh, obesity and metabolic syndrome when they underwent bariatric surgery a lot of these patients actually lost weight after bariatric surgery and there was regression in non alcoholic steatohepatitis there was actually regression in cirrhosis also in some of these patients so it's very important data that very important note note that people if they lose weight they can actually reverse nash or they can reverse uh, Uh, their cirrhosis but everybody is not very open to you know going for a surgical management and surgery has its own uh, pros and cons 
So in this particular study, what they did was they did something known as endoscopic metabolic therapy. So endoscopic metabolic therapy is basically they, they, they underwent endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty versus they, they, they just did an endoscopy, which is like a sham procedure. They, they, it is like a simulated intervention. They did not actually do a gastroplasty. That is like a sham intervention. And they compared the significance in weight reduction between two groups with uh, MASH and obesity. Very striking data. You can actually see at the top here, this green uh, circles here. You can see that patients who underwent endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, they lost 95% of them lost weight compared to just about 60% in the simulated intervention. And they were all on a low calorie diet, a calorie deficit diet. But these numbers are strikingly higher in endoscopic uh, management. Now, when you looked at uh, people who lost at less more than 10% of their basic weight, that is more than 10% of their baseline weight uh, with endoscopic therapy, they found out that the uh, steatohepatitis score and even resolution of NASH was much higher. So in those patients who you think cannot actually practically in day-to-day -day life and routine activity, cannot lose weight uh, with, you know, just with dieting and exercise. This is an excellent choice for them to lose significant weight and uh, resolve NASH, underlying MASH. And I think uh, we should not be, uh, you know, uh, we should not be very meek in uh, discussing these kind of therapies with our patients because uh, it, it improves their life and improves their lifestyle and actually improves or reduces their comorbidities. So this, so for people who are not very well uh, uh, happy or comfortable with going in for a surgery, endoscopic uh, methods of metabolic therapies are a useful uh, modality for uh, improving NASH. This is uh, a very interesting study that was uh, recently discussed in uh, EASL. And uh, this actually shows the importance of something known as SAFE algorithm. So SAFE is basically steatosis associated fibrosis estimator, SAFE. And uh, this is basically a, a calculator, which is based upon the age, BMI, presence of diabetes, uh, platelet numbers, the liver uh, transaminase, that is AST, ALT levels and globulins, which is total protein minus uh, albumin. And very easy to apply, very easy to use at the primary level because you don't need to do any additional testing like ultrasound or uh, you don't need to do any additional testing like a fibroscan or shear wave because uh, what fibroscan and shear wave does is that it tells you if the patient has advanced fibrosis. So that is basically, it has got a good positive predictive value. And uh, it does not actually tell us any difference between uh, minimal fibrosis or significant fibrosis. For example, F0, F1, and F2 and above, it is not very good, the shear wave and uh, fibro scan. But this particular score specifically looks at uh, distinguishing patients between uh, minimal fibrosis versus significant fibrosis. That is F0, F1 versus F2. And it is very simple to apply. If the score is greater than 100, that means the patient has high risk of fibrosis and needs to be uh, referred to a hepatologist or a gastroenterologist for additional testing in the form of a fibro scan or a biopsy. And uh, this is so important because at the primary level, uh, generalists can or surgeons can definitely identify patients who require further management or further uh, evaluation and can uh, without any other additional uh, tools with them. Now, something very important. I'm not sure if uh, the students know about this, but there is a there are there is a huge um, database on studies on coffee and the liver, and I think this is very important. And it is already well established that drinking up to three cups of strong black coffee without any fats or sugars uh, reduces the risk of developing uh, fatty liver disease in metabolic syndrome patients and also re reduces the progression of NAFLD. So this is very, very important. So what this study did was they looked at what is helping, you know, because coffee has a lot of uh, uh, natural chemicals in it and which of this was helping. So initially the uh, researchers thought that caffeine is the most important part of coffee, but in fact it is not. So both caffeine and something known as polyphenol. So polyphenols are basically the natural uh, plant compounds found in coffee. Uh, these include flavonoids, flavonoids, phenolic acid and also amides. What happens is that the polyphenol and caffeine driven uh, reduction in lip lipotoxicity and improvement in uh, steatohepatitis actually reduces the risk of progression of NAFLD and reduces prevention of fatty liver disease in patients with metabolic syndrome. So if your patient 
is a type 2 diabetes with nfld or at high risk of nfld and who drinks coffee please advise the patient to continue to drink coffee which is about 3 or 4 cups a day and you can actually include decaffeinated also because some people don't like caffeine it gives them palpitations and other things uh, some people don't feel they they get heartburns and um, you know uh, gi symptoms so those people can actually use decaffeinated coffee because it's not the caffeine but the polyphenols that are more important and encourage them not to add fats which means no milk and not to add sugars otherwise the protective benefits will not be uh, applicable so uh, coffee and the liver they have a very good relationship and the black coffee actually helps in reducing chances of a progression of nfld and reduces the risk of developing nfld in patients with diabetes and other metabolic diseases so now we come to uh, something uh, more interventional and this is something which is very very new and recently published um, so this is a study known as maestro nash trial uh, which is a study on resmetirone so these are the new drugs that you have to know about Uh, please go back and read uh, the latest uh, review guidelines on the pipeline, the drugs which are in the pipeline for uh, metabolic dysfunction associated steatoid hepatitis, and you will see that this is one very important drug. Uh, basically, resmetirone uh, is a, a thyroid hormone receptor beta selective agonist. So, it's a thyroid hormone receptor beta selective agonist, and it is an oral drug, which is very. It's an excellent drug. It's an oral drug. so what this study found out was that uh, at 80 mg and 100 mg of dose uh, nash resolution was achieved in up to 30% of patients who was on who are on this drug compared to only 10% who was taking placebo and um, this was biopsy proven and fibrosis reversed steatosis reversed uh, lipid functions improved so such meaningful effects on both primary uh, biopsy and points and also disease activity has never been shown in any other drug that we currently use for uh, fatty liver disease so we don't have such a drug so this this is such an important drug and i think this would probably uh, receive the nfd approval very soon and quite quite quickly because this is the only drug currently in uh, uh, trial practice that we have found out to have Uh, effect on both histology and activity in patients with nash irrespective of their uh, weight loss or control of metabolic syndrome so this please remember this name it's known as resmetirone now this is very interesting study and uh, this came up in uh, journal of hepatology reports just um, this month uh, so we talk about um, waist hip ratio we talk about central obesity we talk about uh, abdominal fat visceral fat visceral adiposity etc right for uh, fatty liver disease uh, risk factor and re reduction of all of this actually improves uh, you know the the progression of fatty liver disease or, or results non alcoholic steatoid hepatitis but look at this paper this paper looked at something very strange uh, they looked at the thigh fat distribution so when they looked at people with high thigh fat distribution compared to uh, those with a high abdominal fat distribution so if they had a high thigh fat distribution that is thigh subcutaneous fat distribution compared to abdominal fat area distribution when the ratio was higher the likelihood of uh, developing nfld or the likelihood of remission from nfld was much higher it's quite interesting uh, the authors have not given us a proper mechanism of action on this um, and i i was i could not think from the top of my head how this could actually help in nfld but what they found out was that a favorable fat distribution mostly in the thigh subcutaneous fat region compared to the abdominal fat had a protective role against nfld quite interesting and uh, uh, and the 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 reasons for this is currently unknown but i hope uh, we'll get an explanation on this uh, in the future okay something uh, quite different from what we were discussing now uh, and i think this is something that we neglect uh, regarding sleep so sleep is an important factor in uh, the progression and development of many liver diseases especially um, metabolic uh, dysfunction associated liver disease so but in this particular study they did something very uh, interesting what these authors did was they looked at patients with chronic liver disease and they followed them up or they looked at their sleeping patterns so whenever a person had longer daytime napping so a longer daytime napping means somebody who's napping in the morning or in the afternoon for more than or equal to 1 hour 
versus somebody who did not nap at all. They found out that the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma and the risk of death due to liver related events in CLD was much higher. Just imagine, so simple, somebody who naps more in the morning versus somebody who does not nap at all, a CLD patient, the chances of them dying and the chance of them getting a, a HCC is much higher. Similarly, if a person, a CLD person, a patient sleeps for less than five hours compared to seven to eight hours, which is considered adequate sleep, or if they sleep for more than or equal to nine hours compared to seven or eight hours, then the chances of them developing liver-related death is much higher. So we're just talking about sleep. And make no mistake, the authors have done a wonderful job because they have adjusted this particular data for age, sex, race, education, BMI, smoking, physical activity, you name it, and even alcohol and diabetes. So it's well-controlled study. And they have shown that it is a U-shaped pattern for sleep and CLD. So if somebody sleeps for less than five hours, or more than nine hours at night, the CLD patient, the chances of them developing liver-related mortality and HCC is high. And if somebody with CLD uh, naps for more than one, uh, more than equal to one hour in the day time, then the chance of developing higher HCC and liver-related uh, death is much higher. Such a simple intervention that you can talk to the patients and improve their sleep pattern and sleep duration and sleep quality, which will actually improve their uh, clinical outcomes. Now we come to something a little more complex. I put this up because it's uh, come in NEJM and I think this, this can be part of your question also uh, on uh, NASH. So this, this is now mentioned as NASH because this was before the new terminology came out. So they uh, this is from Rohit Lumba's uh, team. So Rohit Lumba and uh, Arun Sanyal are the ones who voraciously work on uh, NASH, uh, NAFLD. So what they did was they looked at a new molecule known as Pegosa Fermin which is actually a long-acting glycopegylated fibroblast growth factor 21 analog. It's tough, but just remember that name, uh, Pegosa Fermin, which is FGF21 uh, analog, which is pegylated. So what they did was that they looked at patients who were at NASH stage F2 and F3, that is moderate to severe fibrosis, and they gave these patients subcutaneous injections of uh, Pegosa Fermin uh, weekly, uh, once every two weeks, or placebo. And what they found out was that the patients who received uh, this particular drug, they had a reduction of more than or equal to one stage of fibrosis and NASH resolution without fibrosis worsening at about 24 weeks, which is, I think, quite impressive. And uh, those who uh, received placebo, uh, it was only about 2% uh, or so. The other one, it was about 20, uh, 37%. So this is a new drug in the pipeline, which uh, has some potential for uh, treatment of NASH. It might be expensive and it's an injectable. So we don't know how much compliance we can agree with this with the patients, but uh, something new in NASH because we don't have any proper medications for uh, NASH patients at the moment with us in, in current clinical uh, management. So we jump to infectious uh, liver disease. So chronic hepatitis D, you know, we, we don't have much data on this. We don't have much treatment options on it. It's like an orphan disease. I mean, it is actually an orphan disease because this little fellow cannot function without uh, hepatitis B. So the combination of them, that is hepatitis B plus D is notorious. So they can cause high, uh, faster progression of cirrhosis. They can cause uh, early development of HCC, a lot of problems. So we needed something to target hepatitis D. And so we have. Uh, so this is a drug known as bulivertide, which is actually a direct acting uh, viral entry inhibitor. So it prevents the entry of hepatitis D virus into the hepatocytes. And this was given at subcutaneously at 2 milligram per day uh, or 10 milligram per day for about 144 weeks. Um, and then compared to a placebo. And what they found out was that uh, bulivertide actually reduced uh, the circulating hepatitis D virus RNA and completely uh, improved and normalized the ALT levels from baseline, which means this uh, direct acting antiviral has the potential uh, to clear the hepatitis D virus if the patient is having hepatitis B plus D co-infection. This is a phase three randomized trial. Uh, I think we'll have much more data coming in uh, with this. And uh, the particular this particular drug was quite... Uh, safe to use also over long periods of time. The next 
paper that I would like to showcase is again on uh, NFLD. And I think this is a very interesting and surprising paper because what the authors did here was to look at uh, biopsy proven NFLD patients and they followed these patients up for 14 years. I mean, you can see the kind of work that they do. I mean, followed up for about 14 years, biopsy prone NFLD, and they matched these patients with other population comparators. For example, they had NFLD and the other group did not have NFLD, but had other uh, metabolic diseases without underlying NFLD. And uh, what they found out was that in patients who had NFLD at the baseline, when they followed them up, uh, they had a higher incidence of severe infections than the comparators. For example, 32 persons, uh, 32 out of 1,000 person years developed with NFLD developed severe infection compared to 17 only in the comparator group. And the most frequent infections were in respiratory and urinary tract infections. So if somebody has just NFLD at, at, at baseline diagnosis, then the chances of that person developing severe infections beyond a decade is quite high. Now, one thing that the authors did not look here is that um, they did not look at how much the metabolic syndromes were controlled. For example, if somebody has an uncontrolled diabetes, that itself predisposes them to infection. So probably it is not NFLD uh, in isolation, but also the factors that has led to development of NFLD uh, that has put the patient at risk for developing severe infections. But this is very important because even with simple steatosis and with increasing fibrosis, patients started having uh, higher incidence of uh, severe infections on follow-up. So this is very important. And I think uh, we should all be very uh, proactive in discussing control of metabolic uh, traits or uh, uh, syndromes in patients with NFLD. Um, this is another important paper, and uh, this is from chronic hepatitis B. Uh, this was also published in NEJM. So they have a new drug known as Bepiro. Wilson. So uh, it's, I mean, it's getting tougher and tougher for us to actually remember these drugs, but this is, this is also important. So what they did was uh, Bepirovirsin is actually an antisense oligonucleotide and it targets the hepatitis B messenger RNA. So it's, it's very important because it reduces directly acts to reduce all the levels of viral proteins. And it's, it's wonderful because all the antigen proteins are reduced with this particular agent. And what they, what they found out was that um, uh, it, it actually reduces even hepatitis B messenger RNA and pregenomic RNA, which is like you want a functional cure versus a complete cure. This is, this is the uh, drug that is going to be. So what they found out was that uh, it did reduce uh, the viral load levels, it reduced the hepatitis B surface antigen levels uh, in about 10% of patients, and they actually had sustained viral response. That is, HBSAG resolved, I mean, became non-reactive, and DNA loss was there in 10%, and that was sustained. The only problem is that um, many patients in the bepiro Versen group uh, developed uh, adverse events. So the adverse events were mostly in Beprosin uh, compared to uh, the placebo, but they were not very severe adverse events. They were mostly injection site adverse events and uh, may, people actually tolerated it. So we have a drug now which can actually knock out hepatitis B from the, uh, uh, the nucleus uh, and acts at the RNA and pregenomic RNA level, which is quite interesting and very hopeful for people who are looking to completely clear the virus uh, from their um, system. Now we jump to uh, alcohol. So I think this study is so important. This is the study was done by the French group by Alexander Louvet, and this was published in JAMA uh, about a couple of months back, uh, where a very important study, I, I would say, because so we have uh, steroid treatments for alcoholic hepatitis, which is a standard everywhere. And what happens when you mix, uh, when you uh, combine steroids with uh, antibiotic? So when the, this particular study looked at a group of severe alcoholic hepatitis patients receiving steroids, that is prednisolone, along with prednisolone and uh, amoxicillin or clavulanic acid. And what they found out was that the addition of antibiotic, that is amox clavulanic acid to prednisolone, did not improve survival in patients. So this was a negative study, but I think it's very important from two ways. One, the addition of antibiotics as uh, a prevention modality of reducing infections 
when the patient is on steroid or an antibiotic as one of the agents which can modulate the gut microbiome does not work you know that 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 itself is something very important that we need to understand and the second is that a drug like amoxicillin clavulanic acid is actually safe so uh, even at, at some point i was very scared to prescribe amoxicillin clavulanic acid for advanced liver disease patients because amoxclav is the number one cause of dili in the united states that is non paracetamol dili in the united states is amoxclav so i was very i i i never prescribed this but but look at what they have done here the french group actually gave this in the sickest group of patients that is alcoholic hepatitis and found out that there was no there was there were no uh, adverse events uh, with giving this drug so amoxclav is uh, is very safe in uh, patients with advanced liver disease even with jaundice so that is one good point that has come out of this particular study now these are two studies which i want to elaborate a bit on very interesting and i think this is the future of hepatology um so you look at the on the uh, your left side so we can see uh, this is a paper from 2019 nature by duan et al uh, this is from bern schnabel's group in ucsd university of california san diego so what they found out was that when they looked at the uh, specific microorganisms gut bacteria in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis they found out that there was one particular bacteria uh, bacterium which was causing the most significant harm and that was enterococcus faecalis so enterococcus faecalis was the most upregulated and significant bacterium uh, in patients driving severity of alcoholic hepatitis and they looked further and found out that they the particular enterococcus faecalis produces something known as a cytolysin and when the cytolysin levels were higher uh, the severity of alcoholic hepatitis was also higher so what did they do they took a bacteriophage so bacteriophage are basically viruses that consume or or damage uh, or eat up bacteria so they look they took a bacteriophage injected that particular bacteriophage which uh, eats up consumes enterococcus faecalis and they found out that when the bacteriophage was injected and these patients were followed up uh, the enterococcus faecalis levels reduced the cytolysin levels reduced and the severity of alcoholic hepatitis reduced so they did this study in humanized mouse models and this was excellently done because there is some role of phage therapy in management of alcoholic hepatitis now let us go to the other side so this is another group a chinese group so what they did was similar to what uh, the other group did in alcoholic hepatitis they looked at specific microbiota in uh, nash that is metabolic associated fatty liver non steatotic hepatitis that is nfld related non alcoholic and what they found out was that in this particular group klebsiella pneumonia a particular strain of klebsiella pneumonia known as the uh, h1a1c that is H1A1C strain of Klebsiella pneumonia was the one which was causing severity of NASH in mouse models, which was also uh, seen in, in in human models. So what did they do? They did the same thing the other guys did. So they uh, they purified and uh, you know retrieved bacteriophages which will specifically attack that particular Klebsiella pneumonia strain, and they gave it to uh, these mice which have severe alcohol severe non-alcoholic steatotic hepatitis, and found out that. when the phage uh, therapy was given the levels of this particular klebsiella reduced and the non alcoholic steatotic hepatitis actually reduced even histologically this is fantastic so there is a there is a role for precision medicine uh, by targeting specific microbiota bacteria or back group of bacteria uh, in treating uh, alcoholic versus non alcoholic steatotic hepatitis and this uh, second paper was again published in nature and this was from uh, gan et al so i think uh, uh, not just those other drugs that we have seen before phage therapy is also an important upcoming treatment for alcoholic hepatitis and non alcoholic steatotic hepatitis and i think um, it's not one size fits all uh, we will like we treat hepatitis like we treat uh, hiv aids and like we treat uh, tuberculosis with combination drugs the treatment of alcoholic hepatitis and mash in the future will be with combination therapies so we'll have a phage therapy in between we'll have some uh, some a particular uh drug that we discussed before or we and we'll have some lifestyle changes and so many things come together and that is how we have to deal with uh, treatment of these two disease condition and it is never a single drug and that is where we are uh, improving ourselves on regarding this particular treatment now this is a very depressing paper i read this and i was i was quite uh, terribly 
depressed looking at it. So uh, what this particular study looked at was they looked at children of parents with ALD and AUD. So ALD is alcohol associated liver disease and AUD is uh, alcohol use disorder. So the patient, the children of parents with alcohol related liver disease had up to more than fourfold increase for alcohol related hospitalization, even in the absence of alcohol liver disease. So what happens is that if a child has a father with alcohol liver disease and alcohol abuse, the chances of that particular uh, child or the teenager or the, the, the offspring to get hospitalized because of an alcohol use is about two times, 2.1. That is the uh, risk ratio. If the mother has uh, alcohol related liver disease, then the, it's similar to the father. That is about 2.1. But if both parents have alcohol use disorder and is having alcoholic liver disease, then the chances of that child uh, getting hospitalized and going in, going for alcohol use disorder is about 4.4, which is quite bad because uh, you look at what alcohol does to people. You know, it, it just destroys boundaries, uh, even within the family. So this is very important for us to uh, discuss from patient perspective. Tell them that, you know, their children are also at risk of developing alcohol-related uh, hospitalization if the parents are continuing or uh, with, diagnosed with alcoholic liver disease. This is a very interesting paper, and this is from China. And this looked at, um, you know, the, the specialty of uh, the Chinese population is that uh, there is a lot of uh, stroke and uh, intracerebral hemorrhage uh, in China compared to other countries. So this particular group of uh, researchers, what they did was they looked at what was the risk, additional risk factor that these people have. Why are Chinese getting more of... Uh, hemorrhagic stroke or you know uh, uh, bleeding intracerebral bleeds compared to people in other countries and they found out the answer as hepatitis b infection so chinese population are the highest uh, when it comes to prevalence of hepatitis b infection and patients with hepatitis b virus infection have a higher risk of developing intracerebral hemorrhage but not ischemic so ischemic stroke is mostly for metabolic diseases, but intracerebral hemorrhage is mostly for chronic hepatitis B virus infection. And this is something the Chinese group identified. So somebody has hepatitis B uh, virus infection, uh, please remember that the chances of them developing an intracerebral hemorrhage is quite high. Uh, this again, like the other alcohol study and the child uh, children study, this is also depressing because uh, see, we are so happy with direct acting antivirals. So when you give direct acting antivirals, uh, we are like happy that you know they have sustained viral response. That it's so easy to treat hepatitis C. But what this particular study showed was that um, even after completely uh, curing the patient of hepatitis C, that is, there is sustained viral response over many many years. That is, this particular study looked at a follow up of six years, and patient had compensated chronic liver disease. Uh, what they found out was that even after the cure from hepatitis C the risk of hepatic decompensation and the risk of liver cancers was still high. So about 4% of patients, that is about 1 in 10, that is 1 in 10 patients with advanced liver disease with an hepatitis C cure can still develop complications related to decompensation and liver cancer. And uh, I have put this particular uh, uh, picture here for you to understand what is a... Um, advanced, compensated, advanced chronic liver disease. So when you look at the fibroscan, so the fibroscan is about 20 kilopascals. Uh, that is an advanced uh, chronic liver disease uh, stage. That is CACLD. That is as per the Babino, uh, latest Babino guidelines. And if it goes above 25, that means that this patient has advanced liver disease plus significant, clinically significant portal hypertension. So in the CLD group, CACLD group, that is compensated advanced chronic liver disease group, there is no significant portal hypertension. But these group of patients, even with an hepatitis C cure, can develop, one in 10 of them can develop uh, decompensation and liver cancer, and they need to be followed up and they need to be under surveillance as per standard cirrhotic protocols. So please don't think that after driving away hepatitis C, things are all fine. If they have underlying uh, compensated advanced chronic liver disease, they are still at risk of developing uh, advanced liver disease uh, events and also liver cancer. Uh, another very interesting study where a group of patients with uh, moderate to severe liver disease was taken, that is child PU score 7 to 10, and uh, a group of them were given rivaroxaban. So rivaroxaban is an anticoagulant and it blocks the factor 10A activity. So what the authors hypothesized was that if you block factor 10 activity, the hepatic, stel, uh, hepatic stellate cell activation also reduces because factor 10 is an important aspect in uh, 
uh, activation of hepatic stellate cells. And that actually reduces the vascular, microvascular complications and fibrotic complications in cirrhosis. So what they did was they gave a group rivaroxaban and they gave another group uh, placebo. And what they found out was that uh, when they looked at these patients over um, about uh, 24 months, that is about two years, they found out that the patients who were receiving this anticoagulant, they had lesser development of decompensation and higher survival without transplantation. Fantastic. This is a fantastic paper. So what you do is when you have patients with uh, advanced liver disease, say a child 7 to 10, and uh, you want to actually reduce the chances of decompensation or uh, improve, increase the transplant-free survival, the, uh, the, the use of an anticoagulant uh, like rivaroxaban may actually help. So this has to come into recommendations, but this study is the start of uh, something uh, new in the future for management of liver disease per se from a general point of view. This is also a very interesting study that I found very useful. I just love this study because this is something I used to do. Because uh, so, so we, we, I mean, we do get a lot of patients with autoimmune hepatitis, right? And our go-to drug as per all the guidelines is azathioprine. So we have steroids with azathioprine. But um, a lot of patients in my practice don't tolerate azathioprine well. So some of them develop pancreatitis, some of them develop leukopenia, cytopenias. Some of them are intolerant. They have a lot of gastritis issues, vomiting. So for such patients, I used to give mycophenolate morphetin. And at some point, I realized that, you know, people are actually uh, tolerating MMF much more than AZ, uh, azathioprine. I started giving everybody MMF and I stopped using azathioprine at some point. But then this study actually proves that if you give mycophenolate morphetil compared to azathioprine as the uh, first line of treatment, that is in treatment naive patients with autoimmune hepatitis, then they developed micro, um, uh, biochemical remission far better. That is, mycophenolate morphetil with prednisolone was far better and superior to azathioprine with prednisolone in the treatment of treatment naive autoimmune hepatitis. So that is 56.4% versus 29%, which is excellent because the only catch is that MMF is expensive. But the other catch is that you don't have to monitor it so much and you can increase the dose and patients are very comfortable with uh, uh, tolerating it. So I think this is a good study where we'll see that uh, mycophenolate may become the uh, go-to drug for treatment naive patients with autoimmune hepatitis. Um, the next study is on ACLF, and I think probably this is the only study I have put up for ACLF. Uh, this study is something very important and interesting. Uh, I'm not sure how much practical this is. So they made a new dialysis, liver dialysis device known as Dialiv. So this is by Rajiv Jalan's group. And what they did was that they looked at uh, treating patients with ACLF uh, class 1 to class 3A. So class 3A and 3B, please remember this. This is something that you might not know. So ACLF with three organ failures is ACLF 3A and ACLF with four to six organ failures is ACLF 3B. So we have ACLF class 0, 1, 2, 3, right? So inside 3, you have 3A and 3B. 3B is the worst, worst of the lot because they have very high mortality. So they did not take 3B in this particular study. They took up till 3A. And what they did was that in this particular study of Dialiv, they found out that, that they found that uh, patients had significant reduced time to resolution of ACLF. And also the prognostic scores, like the Cliff C score, Cliff ACLF score, uh, the mortality at 28 days, all of this actually improved with Dialiv uh, compared to standard of care alone. So uh, what Dialiv does specifically is it works on albumin and endotoxin. So there are specific filters uh, which removes PAMs and DAMs. So the pathogen-associated molecular patterns and damage-associated molecular patterns, that is endotoxin and dysfunctional albumin, it, it acts at that particular level and acts as a dialysis machine. Uh, works like uh, your, I mean, your classical Mars and Prometheus, but has a different set of um, combinations and ports. And uh, this actually improved ACLF. So we, have, we may have something that we can intervene uh, in patients with ACLF, which is also higher grade of ACLF, like 3A, to increase the transplant-free survival or improve the bridge towards transplantation. Now, another study which we very commonly use. So I have not done a taste procedure uh, for my patients in the last two years because I have uh, this particular luxury, I would say, uh, at Rajagiri for SBRT. So that is stereotactic body radiation therapy. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, it's very well tolerated. It is done on an OPD basis, and it's not very expensive like we have for uh, taste and all that. 
and tear. So what this particular study did was they looked at patients with very advanced liver disease, uh, that is child flu, child flu uh, class A and B, uh, with metastatic liver disease and with tumoral thrombosis. So patient, basically we could not offer them tear or uh, we could not offer them taste or RFA or microwave ablation or even transplantation. And such patients, what they did was they gave, put one group only on sorafenib and another group on sorafenib mm -hmm. with SBRT. So SBRT can be done in advanced liver cancers. It's very interesting. Even with uh, very high level of, advanced level of microvascular invasion, uh, we can do SBRT. So when they looked at patients with SBRT and sorafenib, they found out, out they found that uh, the, the median overall survival and the median progression-free survival was much higher with patients on SBRT and sorafenib. Very importantly, patients were downstaged better with the use of SBRT and sorafenib rather than sorafenib and SBRT, rather than sorafenib alone. So please uh, note that if you have patients uh, in your clinical practice where you, you, you are looking at BCLCC and you are stuck with just the medical therapies and pharmacotherapies, please remember that SBRT, even though it is not coming to guidelines, but I'm sure it is going to come very soon because it is already in Japanese guidelines. It is a fantastic modality. It just melts away the tumor. Absolutely no uh, side effects to the patients as much I have, or what I have seen except for large tumors where they can develop uh, some uh, tumor necrosis related uh, uh, side effects, but otherwise well tolerated by many patients, even the elderly. SBRT actually improves uh, downstaging chances and also improves overall survival and progression free survival in advanced liver cancer. So this is something new that will soon come in Baveno, uh, your uh, BCLC guidelines also. Now, very interesting uh, drug. I, I'm sure you have heard about semaglutide. It's all over the news. Ozempic is the name. And what Ozempic did was, so when the US, they studied this particular molecule, they found out that uh, this not only improved diabetes, but also reduced weight. So this was like a wonder drug, a magic drug, where people could also lose weight without exercise. And uh, Ozempic was a big hit there. So what did uh, Rohit Lumba's group do? What they did was, this came in Lancet Gastron Hepatology. They, what they did was, they gave semaglutide in patients with NASH-related cirrhosis. And this was a phase two trial. And they gave other, another group uh, placebo. And what they found out was that, just like what they found out in other studies in diabetes, many patients, on a large proportion of patients on semaglutide actually lost weight. And they lost a good amount of weight. But the anticlimax is that, uh, that weight loss did not uh, translate to fibrosis regression. So there was no change in fibrosis or no regression in cirrhosis, even with that weight loss, even though that weight loss led to improvement in cardiometabolic parameters and also a lot of non-invasive uh, fibrosis markers and liver injury markers actually reduced. But it did not translate to uh, improvement in cirrhosis or fibrosis grade, which is actually a kind of a bummer moment. I mean, it was anticlimax for me, if you ask me, because even though weight reduced, uh, the fibrosis did not. But the the uh, to play the devil's advocate here, uh, this study was very small uh, numbered study. The sample size was small and the follow-up was also quite small. This is a, just at 48 weeks. So if you maybe look at 72 weeks, you can actually see improvement in fibrosis better, maybe. So uh, I think we need to work on this molecule more because I think this molecule has a great potential in management of uh, NASH-related cirrhosis, especially in patients with obesity and diabetes. Another new drug, I'm sure I'm not sure if you have heard of it. This is the first time I'm, looking, I'm seeing this. This is known as Larsucosterol, and this is for severe alcoholic hepatitis. And what lar Larsucosterol is, 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 is basically an endogenous sulfated oxysterol, and it is an epigenetic regulator. Right. So, I mean, I'm not going into uh, uh, basically, basically not going into more details of that. But what epigenetic regulators do is that they modulate gene expressions within the nucleus of the cell without altering the DNA sequence. So, what they do is they modulate the gene expression within the nucleus without altering underlying DNA sequence. So, these are like really much into the future kind of molecules we are now dealing with. So what they did here is that when they gave Larsu Costerol for patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis, they found out that one, it is safe. Patients tolerated it very well. And second, patients actually survived. Even though the numbers were small to look at significance, a larger proportion of patients survived when they were on this particular Larsu Costerol. And it was just an infusion 
uh, about 72 hours apart. And uh, most important is that biochemical parameters improved, but we don't know what is going to happen to the clinical parameters because this was just a safety and a tolerance study. So I think this molecule also will have some value in the future uh, for the treatment of al severe alcoholic hepatitis. I'm not sure how the cost is going to be because it's such a futuristic deadly molecule. And uh, I think we need to have more uh, studies on it. Very important. So this study, what happens is, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, all of us will agree that even I, I used to do this. A decompensated patient comes to the emergency. What do you do first? You give them ceftriaxone, like they are deficient in ceftriaxone, right? So everybody gets a cefepirazone or a ceftriaxone. Some even get piperazil tazobactam the moment they land up in the ER or they get admitted. So does it help? So this particular study, what they did was they looked at patients from the entire trial, and they looked at all the patients who received. Uh, empirical antibiotics at admission, decommensated patients versus those patients who did not receive antibiotics at decommensated patients who did not receive antibiotics at admission in the ER or in the wards. And what they found out was that there was no difference at all in hospital acquired infection or mortality. So basically just giving antibiotic the moment patient lands in the ER or gets admitted does not work out for the benefit of the patient. And uh, in some of the patients, that is uh, when the decompensations were severe enough, uh, the use of antibiotics in the absence of infections actually led to more mortality. So this is also not good news. So if you look at this particular uh, data here, this, this in yellow here, so patients given long-term antibiotic prophylaxis at discharge had no differences in six-month mortality compared with non-antibiotic patients. So there is no point in just giving an antibiotic to a patient, especially decommensated cirrhosis patient, the moment you see him in the ice, in the emergency. So if at all you want to continue antibiotics, please make sure the patient is infected and there should be documented infection. Otherwise, please stop antibiotics. This is my uh, last uh, slide. And uh, this is completely different from what we... Uh, spoke about this is just for a lighter moment for all of us because I'm sure you're, you'll be tired after listening to a lot of uh, those new studies on new new molecules. Very interesting. So this is about Beethoven. You know, Ludwig van Beethoven is a very famous musician. Um, when, when he died in, I think, 1867, um, he had hearing impairment. So he had progressive hearing loss and uh, he had a lot of issues. He had diarrhea. He used to have a lot of GI problems and ultimately he died of jaundice. Uh, because his autopsy actually showed that he had underlying liver disease and he died of, died of jaundice. Now, how did he die? So Be Beethoven never knew what he died of. So what he did was that he wrote letters saying that after his death, somebody should find out what he died of and should make it public. So this became one of the biggest, most sought out medical mysteries in the world ever. How did Beethoven die? And ultimately what happened was that based on a lot of exhumations, bones and all that collected from Beethoven's gravesite, and also some of these hair locks, see this? So a lot of private collectors and public collectors uh, collected Beethoven's hair and they, kept, they keep it in their own private museums and all that. So a lot of these hair strands were available, about eight locks are available by, by different collectors. So what, what one group identified was that in one of those uh, locks, of hair, uh, there was high levels of lead. So the cause of death, they said, was that it was because of lead poisoning. So uh, basically what happened was that at that time, doctors, when they used to clean wounds or give some solutions, it was all based on lead salts. So the lead salt poisoned Beethoven and Beethoven ultimately died of lead poisoning is what the original thought was until now. So this came in 2023 and this is a fantastic paper which was published in Current Biology where a group of researchers, archaeology and molecular biologists, they looked at all these hair strands, the eight locks of hair, and they did something known as a genomic analysis based on an ancestral DNA data. So we, we have a lot of ancestral DNA database now because of a lot of these companies checking DNA and telling people how their gut health is, how their other health is, how their organ health is. We have a lot of people submitting DNA for analysis regarding their ancestry. So we have a large database of ancestral DNA data. So what they did was they ran all these uh, hair DNA samples through that particular ancestral database and found out that three hairs did not belong to Beethoven. Five of them belonged to the same European uh, ancestral category of, of a male. Three of them did not. Out of that three, one was actually from a woman from Jewish descent. 
And that was the hair which contained lead, which means Beethoven did not die of lead poisoning. That, that was some other person's hair. So now they are st stuck with what actually killed Beethoven. So what they did was they did whole exome sequencing and found out that Beethoven had two types of liver disease related mutations. So one was PN, PLA3, that is your patatin like phosphatase, which is very commonly seen in fatty liver disease. And the second was HFE mutation, a variant of HFE mutation. So he had two, that is HFE and PN, PLA3, which are well known to produce cause cirrhosis. But then they, they were actually heterozygous. So what was the driving factor? Then they looked at all the letters that Beethoven has written and found out that he was actually an alcohol user. And he used to drink a lot of alcohol, even though they claim it is modest. Alcohol, in the presence of these heterozygous mutations, are found to cause cirrhosis. Very interesting. So HFE mutation with PNP, PNPLA3 mutation, just based on hair strand analysis and the presence of cirrhosis on biopsy, proved that uh, Beethoven died of cirrhosis due to these mutations plus alcohol. But there was one very interesting uh, googly there. One of the hair strands, which was recently collected, uh, actually showed the presence of hepatitis B virus infection. So ultimately what happened was that at the time that Beethoven died suddenly, he had severe jaundice, which means he had a reactivation of hepatitis B possibly at the time. And because he was already having underlying cirrhosis because of two genetic mutations and use of alcohol, the hepatitis B reactivation actually killed him. So the reason why Beethoven died is because of alcohol and hepatitis B which was driven by HFE and PNP lethary mutation. Wonderful, wonderful medical analysis in hepatology based on the sharpest of tools that we have, that is genomic analysis. And I think this is going to change the future of hepatology management because now when you look at management of hepatocellular carcinoma, you look at management of alcoholic hepatitis, you look at management of NASH or MASH, the genomic analysis and landscaping of genetic profiling and epigenetic profiling of all these diseases, we will have much more to target in these patients. And this is going to become a great, uh, you know, find a great weapon for us to treat patients of cirrhosis in the future, liver disease in the future. And I would like to end by one uh, big climax from this particular research study. So while they were doing an understanding, I mean, how Beethoven died, they found out something else. So uh, Beethoven's father, so that his name is Ar Arwen van Beethoven. They found out that the Y chromosome was not from him. It was from somebody else, which means that Beethoven's mother actually had an extramarital affair. And Beethoven is actually not Beethoven. It's somebody else's son. So that also they identified on this particular uh, analysis that Beethoven actually did not, was not really born from Beethoven family. It was from some other family and there was an extramarital affair. So I would like to conclude my uh, uh, session here and uh, I would like to hand over uh, to the moderators and the chairpersons to please take over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhi, for a wonderful uh, discussion on a varied topics in hepatology, including the genomic studies of uh, Beethoven and uh, how this uh, disease manifested with a flare of hepatitis B. Dr. Varghese Thomas, can we have another 15 minutes for yeah, definitely, discussion? Definitely. Any questions from the students? There, there's only one question in the chat box. So there are one or two. Uh, the, the one, uh, uh, Abhi, can you just open the chat box? and? Uh, yes, yes, sir. I've, I've got it. So uh, there is one question. Uh, can we use rivaroxaban to reverse decompensated state? <clears throat> So that particular study uh, actually showed that rivaroxaban use prevents, uh, reduces the chances of decompensation. It, it does not mean that you can actually reverse the decompensated state. So this was basically used in patients who were on uh, already on treatment for decompensated cirrhosis, child seven to ten, um, and when they were given these, uh, when they were given rivaroxaban, it prevented further decompensation and reduced. Um, the trans improved the transplant free survival. So the, the whole aspect of decommensurated state does, does not independently rest on rivaroxaban use, but also other measures, for example, beta blockers and diuretics, etc. So there is Another one more sorry. question from uh, Saji that any development for the use of aptens in, in refractory ascites? Um, uh, so the aptens. Um, so what Vaptans do is that they will definitely improve the 
sodium status. So you can correct hyponatremia with the use of Vaptans. But it does not clinically translate to improved clinical outcomes. So that is what all the Vaptan studies have shown. So if you give Vaptans, tall Vaptan, and, uh, and you raise the sodium from 120 to 135, that does not mean that patient is going to improve clinically. I mean, some any clinical event is going to improve in the future. So it is just for the sodium correction it is used. Otherwise, it has no clinically translatable benefits. Now, one, two more two more two on more FMT, protocol on FMT, and then uh, your comments on current indications for FMT. So the uh, protocols are not standardized because FMT is still a research uh, protocol. And um, I mean, the protocol that I use here and the protocol that ILBS use and the protocol that PJ Chandigarh use, very different. So I use a, a nasoduodenal protocol. Uh, PJ Chandigarh uses a rectal enema protocol and ILBS uh, uses an endoscopic protocol. So it differs. So there is no standardization. But uh, whatever the studies have shown is that independent of uh, the mode, the route of administration or the duration of administration, the outcomes are almost similar. We don't have a meta-analysis of this, but there is a meta-analysis coming up. There is a group in Mayo doing it. Uh, and I think we'll have some better idea of which route and which uh, duration of therapy will be useful. But at the moment, we have no standardization. What about the concept of recompensation? I don't really believe that the recompensation lasts for a longer period of, period of time. What is your view on a recompensation? So I think uh, recompensation is something that we can uh, speak to the patients about. Uh, I'm not sure if recompensation really has uh, an impact on the natural history because that is driven by so many other factors. But recompensation definitely has uh, an impact on the patient uh, because that uh, helps the patient uh, to be motivated and stick with the treatments at then. For example, the most important aspect of recompensation is seen in alcoholic hepatitis. Patients who develop alcoholic hepatitis and uh, ACLF, when they stop drinking and you give them targeted treatment, and if they keep continue to stop drinking and remain abstinent, they have very prolonged uh, transplant-free survival. So in that sense, I think recompensation is useful, but uh, from a natural history point of view, I'm not very sure. That's a question by Dr. Saji. Is uh, Bolivar tried acting by blocking entry of hep B? Yes. Bolivar tried is actually a direct acting uh, agent. So, another drug which you mentioned was uh, the one which actually uh, probably will also stop producing hepatitis B hepatitis antigen also. That's a concern for many people going for going to Gulf and other countries. No, yes, <laughs> we were always yes, at a loss to have to uh, have to stop uh, the HBSAG production. So probably that yes, will sir. be that is uh, Bepirovirsin. That is the drug Bepirovirsin. But all it's an injectable drug. Yeah, all tongue twisting drugs. <laughs> Names are very difficult. Jandi, ma'am, your comments. What? A... I was just admiring and just listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Philip, for that wonderful update. It was really wonderful. I mean, Thank you. Was somewhat, maybe one or two have come across, but almost all were just most updated. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. What was there's a question on Marcel. And uh, Abhi, there was also some mentioning that uh, is a uh, communication, no? Met ALD, no? That's what we should yes. use. Yeah. Combination. So the yeah, so that is uh, this particular slide, sir. <clears throat> this particular slide, talking. which shows that, uh, you know, depending on the amount of alcohol consumed weekly versus daily in males and females, you have a spectrum where there is only MASLD and then the other end of the spectrum is ALD predominant MASLD. That is your MET ALD. And if it goes beyond that, then it becomes PAKA, full form ALD. So that and means uh, are some of the features of metabolic syndrome plus Alcohol yes. in 50 to 60 grams per day. Okay. Yes, yes. That's right, sir. Dr. Abhi, we are changing the term NAFLD to MAFLD and other things. But when it comes to ALD, is there not a taboo also? You are taking alcohol liver disease to yeah. a person who has been drinking. I think uh, the changing the name does not take away the, the basic uh, spectrum of the disease. I think it is a group of hepatologists who wanted to bring something so that the field is growing. I don't think it serves any purpose at the end of a 
two years from 2020 to 2023. I think still we use the taboo word uh, alcoholic liver disease. We have to find a new word for alcoholic liver disease. Uh, if there is a, something called uh, a taboo with the word alcohol or with the word fatty. Your views. Yes, sir. Um, sir, this, this term of um, alcoholic, uh, what ASLD mentions is that it should be alcohol-associated liver disease, not alcoholic liver disease. Similar to we say alcoholic hepatitis, it should be alcohol-associated hepatitis. But still there and, is a word alcohol. Yeah, I mean, uh, the etiology, I'm not sure how much we can modify there, sir. Because in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver, I mean, they are not even consuming alcohol. So why bring in the word in the first place? So that was the, no, the critique. No, they are consuming alcohol. See, when you say non-alcoholic, you have given the earlier definition of less than 20 grams, which means they may be still consuming alcohol. Yes, now they'll come under meta LD. No, what I'm telling is, when you have an alcohol, which uh, any, any quantity, it is dangerous, whether it is 20 grams or less than 20 grams. Yes, yes, sir. When you use the word alcoholic liver disease, I think still there is a taboo. I think uh, it is a gimmick of uh, hepatologists very frankly speaking, which I think yes. uh, is not taking the field forward, but it is just trying to have uh, a few things uh, charted out for one to two years. True, sir. I mean, I, I, I agree with that. There are some more questions in the chat box, Abhi. There is a question on, <clears throat> there is a question on uh, single lesion HCC with more than 10 centimeter. Um, see, I mean, uh, I think we need to have a lot more data on that because if it's a single lesion HCC, more than 10 centimeter with a very low AFP without any macrovascular invasion, fairly preserved liver functions, I mean, I would definitely uh, opt for a liver transplant because it can come in beyond Milan. But if there is a very high AFP and we need to downstage this patient, uh, I would either choose a taste procedure or an SBRT because we do SBRT in large HCCs, even with macrovascular invasion. And that helps us downstage this patient and then shift to a transplant scenario. So ultimately, whatever we choose for our patients with HCC, we look at if these patients can be cured with a transplant at some point, except those patients with BCLCC and patients with metastatic uh, liver cancers where we cannot offer much from curative point of view. So I think just by that lesion size, uh, we, we can't take a, a sure shot decision. I think there should be a lot more uh, data available for us to make a proper approach to that particular patient. But do you think that a 10 centimeter lesion, if it has got a low AFP and you do the uh, you do any other procedure by downstaging, you take it up for any other uh, specific procedure, will it have a better survival? So definitely. So there is this data from uh, Busan, from the Korean group, where they have shown that downstaged uh, HCC patients when they, when, who undergo liver transplant versus just downstaging and medical management, actually they have a better transplant free, I mean, better survival than those who are only on medical care. So this, this is a very, uh, I mean, at least in Southeast Asian countries, this is a very commonly followed norm where they downstage and then take for it, uh, transplant. But if they have a baseline, very high AFP, then things change. Chances of recurrence of HCC uh, in the graft is also very high, even if it is fully downstaged. Some more questions. Vargas yes. Thomas. Yes. Yeah. Just one session or multiple sessions, Abhi? Uh, pardon me, ma'am. The yes. downstaging. Yeah, well, downstaging, uh, especially those with portal vein thrombosis and all. Is it just few sittings or one sitting or? Um, so, uh, ma'am, if it depends on the type of modality intervention that we use. So, for example, if it is a taste, some no, some some uh, some operators do staged taste because it, it won't cover the whole ten centimeters, the the lipidiol and the chemotherapy mixture. But if it is an SBRT, we can cover the whole uh, ten centimeters with a uh, radiation. So, uh, so how many uh, sittings generally? How many sittings uh, five, generally? Five, 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 five sessions. Yes. Low dose today, five sessions. Generally. Yeah, today SBRT is making a major impact, and and in, in fact, no no case of HCC is turned back without an SBRT. Yes, yes. I mean, we have fantastic. I mean, we would wish to publish it sometime next year. We have very good data on large number of patients on SBRT. I mean, I have not done taste for about two and a half years now. It's just SBRT, fantastic. 
Any new changes in the ACL guidelines, Nisal? No, I, I mean, guidelines are all the same, but a lot more on pathogenesis and gut microbiome related uh, uh, data are coming up in ACLF. But, uh, and also a lot more data on transplantation. Uh, high grades of ACLF, they fare much better with transplantation than without. So such data is also coming up. There's a question regarding uh, phage therapy, indications and practical applications. So, uh, it is um, it's currently, very experimental, no? Yeah, it's very very experimental. Currently, there are no indications for phage therapy. I think there was one, uh, I mean, I think the largest numbers of phage therapy studies done is in sepsis. For example, uh, for, especially in MDR and XDR related uh, infections, they have given phase therapies to tackle MDR infections. And there are some studies on that. But otherwise, from a hepatology point of view, it's purely research-based because uh, phase therapy to isolate the particular phage itself is very expensive. And it's not, not yet commercialized at all. The question from Joe, yes, asked, uh, why could uh, be the children of ethanol use parents have increased ethanol related hospitalization risk? Is it genetic or environmental or due to, due to cohabitation uh, or behavioral influence, something, something like that? I, I think all of those points work out. So they definitely do have a genetic predisposition. Uh, environmental impact is there, cohabitation is there, and behavior influence. And I think all of this work together. Uh, to impact the, uh, the the offsprings to take up alcohol. And the reason for hospitalization is not because of liver. That is the most important in that particular study. It was non-liver related causes. For example, blackouts, uh, uh, suicide attempts, uh, vehicle crashes, accidents, and things like that. Your study regarding the sleep and HCC, no? Is it that uh, people with advanced disease may be having either inversion of sleep rhythm or prolonged sleep due to drowsiness, and that indirectly reflects upon their risk of uh, uh, severe liver disease and HCC? Uh, yes, I mean, I would definitely agree with that. If, if that was uh, controlled for, I'm not very sure. Uh, but what they have done is that they have enrolled patients who did not have any uh, decompensation at the baseline. Just the ones who are sleeping, napping in the morning versus those who are not napping in the morning and uh, those with poor sleep at night versus those without poor sleep at night. And I think that was a pretty well matched cohort. And in them, in the long term, they have identified this. But definitely, I'm not sure how much uh, of liver disease severity was there in those particular group of patients. And I think I, think I need to read on that a bit more. Okay. Uh, regarding this uh, dialogue by Rajiv Jalan group, uh, how do you compare with our PLEX, which is uh, our poor man's uh, liver dialysis, you know, PLEX therapy? I think PLEX therapy, I, uh, the, it's it's pretty much, uh, I mean, there are no good quality studies on PLEX, uh, to be honest. But whatever studies that we have, when we looked at all the, I mean, there are, there are some systematic reviews on it, which shows that PLEX therapy does not work in alcoholic hepatitis. All the more, especially if the patient has alcoholic hepatitis in a higher grade of ACLF, for example, ACLF 2 or 3A, uh, 3B is absolutely out of the question, the, it worsens the uh, outcome. So such patients don't do well with PLEX. I mean, personally, I have stopped doing PLEX since uh, probably 2019. I have not done any PLEX in alcoholic hepatitis. Regarding that in hepatic hypothyroidism in NFL. Are there any insights into that? Why it happens actually when the thyroid profile is normal in the serum, but only inside the liver there is a hypothyroidism. Any idea on that? Um, sir, that I, I, I'm not sure if that has something to do with uh, dysregulated metabolism of thyroid hormones, specifically in the liver microenvironment. That I'm not very sure. I mean, exact signaling pathways, I'm not oh. sure. But I think it is something to do with purely the liver microenvironment because of dysregulated blood flow, presence of fibrosis, presence of a yeah. localized inflammatory milieu there. Okay, I think we had a very exhaustive session uh, before the uh, comments by Shanai Sar Jandima. No, I think uh, we have to thank Dr. Abhi for taking his time and uh, enriching us with the recent advances in hepatology across various aspects of liver disease. A big thanks to Dr. Abhi from our group. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity also. And uh, all of you can give a big round of applause through your reaction box.
he can show the reaction or uh, only few of us are on the video. Okay, but I, I am sure Dr. Abhi would have spent a lot of time, a lot of time making the wonderful slides. And slides are also equally beautiful and simple and uh, you know, showing a lot of diagrams. So I am sure you would have taken such a a lot of time to prepare this and they are very current because ESL has happened uh, last month and uh, the data is also very current and most of these things would, don't, would not have come in uh, print also. So the students will be extremely uh, happy because these are fantastic, wonderful information. I was just half struck by listening to all the new drugs and developments. So, Jayanti Ma'am, your final comments. I, I have to just say thank you. <laughs> it's so difficult for people like us to update, you know, and I do not know, some of these never get updated even in the conferences that we attend, you know, we keep hearing the same thing. So I think thank you, Abhi, and a big uh, uh, regards to your dad, okay. Okay, so yes, on behalf you. of ISC Kerala chapter and on behalf of all the uh, other faculty, faculty members uh, and all the students, uh, I say a big thank you to Dr. Sirek Abhi Philip, who has done a great job. Thank you. Thank so, you, sir. And good night. Uh, so good you. night. So the great Do job. well. Do well, Abhi. Good night. Good, good night. Good. And we will... Okay, the recorded version will be available and it will be posted soon. The link will be posted soon. It is already there in the Facebook. It, the videos will be available. Okay. So I am, I am uh, signing off. Good night. Good night.